find the right set of ideas. We looked a little bit at your company during the break, but part of the history of your company includes the artist Stevie Wonder. Right. Well, my first major invention was a print-to-speech reading machine for the blind. He was actually our first customer. He caught me on the Today Show and actually uh, called, called us up, said he wanted to drop over and get one. We were just finishing one up. So he came over. We spent the day showing him how to use it, and he left with it in his taxi. It was pretty big. It was almost as big as he was. Uh, but he was our first customer. And so I became friends with him. This was 1976, so this was 30 years ago. And in, in uh, 1982, we had a conversation about the world of music. He was showing me around his new studio, Wonderland, and lamenting that there were these two disconnected worlds of musical instruments. There was the acoustic world with these beautiful sounds like piano and, and guitar and, and guitar and violin. But <coughs> you couldn't control those sounds. In fact, most musicians couldn't even play them at all. And if you could play a violin, you could only play one note at a time and so on. And then there was this electronic world where you could play polyphonically and you could have the computer remember what you played and play it back and play another line over it and you could modify the sounds. But the sounds you had to work with were very thin electrical sounding sounds back in 82. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could combine these powerful computer control methods with these beautiful sounds of choice of uh, acoustic instruments? And so that was the goal of Kurzweil Music, I felt using pattern recognition and signal processing that was feasible. And with Stevie Wonder as our musical advisor, we created Kurzweil Music. In 84, we introduced the Kurzweil 250, which has been recognized as the first electronic musical instrument that could realistically recreate the grand piano and other acoustic instruments, because we really modeled the ability of those instruments to, to create sounds. Cary, North Carolina. Uh, this is a great program. I'm very interested in the concept of calendar reform, and I wonder if Mr. Kurzweil has studied that. We use a very antiquated model of calendar. On the uh, Internet, there are many very good scientific proposals to replace it, and the, the Catholic Church has uh, approved this uh, uh, innovation if it's ever passed by the world. What do you think? Well, we are actually stuck with a lot of antiquated ideas, uh, like the layout of the typewriter keys, the QWERTY keyboard. That was actually designed to prevent keys from uh, interlocking because of the specific limitations of mechanical typewriters, uh, not because it's an efficient way to type, and there's been lots of proposals to change that. Uh, these ideas gather momentum. I mean, that's why certain companies or technical standards continue, because people learn how to use them, and then it's very hard to, uh, to change those things. Uh, so, what does he mean by calendar reform? I think he's talking about like January and February. That February has 28 days, except when it doesn't. And uh, is that what you mean? I do, he's he's no longer uh, with us. I, I assume that's what he means. So we have certain traditions for measuring things or for for laying out information, like on a typewriter keyboard, that that go back and are based on realities that are no longer with us but we're stuck with those, uh, those traditions, and it's very hard to change those traditions. But uh, we have technology that can keep track of our calendar pretty well, and we're used to it, so I, I don't see it changing uh, very quickly. Baltimore, Maryland, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Kurzweil. Uh, my name is Daryl Nazareth, and I'm a physicist uh, doing research in radiation oncology. I'm a fan of yours, and I uh, look at your website every day. Now, my question is, when I talk to people about the upcoming technological revolution, then uh, they typically have the same question, which is if machines are going to perform more and more human tasks, then won't that result in massive human unemployment? So my thoughts are that as the need for human labor goes down, then the cost of living will also decrease and therefore humans won't need to work as hard in order to maintain a high standard of living. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, suppose we were s sitting here 100 years ago, let's say around 1900, and uh, let's say I were a, a prescient futurist, and I, and I told you, well, today 30% of the population work in factories and 30% work on farms. But I, I predict that within a century, around the year 2000, that figure will be 3% in factories and 3% on farms. And 
the casual observer would say, my God, it's going to lead to massive unemployment. And uh, I probably wouldn't be able to say, well, don't worry, they'll get jobs as web designers and internet technicians because we didn't understand those professions. In fact, most jobs today didn't exist. Those job categories didn't exist 100 years ago. We actually have a higher percentage of the population working today. Uh, there's about 30% of the population working in 1870. Uh, that figure has it's gone up to about 50%. And uh, jobs pay six times as much in constant dollars as they did 120 years ago. Uh, so uh, so what, what has happened? We've been eliminating jobs at the bottom of the skill ladder, uh, both uh, physical and mental, and creating new jobs at the top of the skill ladder. So the skill ladder has moved up. And in fact, a lot of the new employment's in education. We had 50,000 college students in 1870. There's six or seven million today. We spend far more per, per capita in constant dollars on K through 12 education to provide this higher level of skills. And that, that process is going to continue. And we're actually going to make ourselves smarter. Now, you could say we're doing that already. In fact, if people weren't, if we didn't have this sort of mind amplifier in terms of our technology and search engines and the internet, most people couldn't do their jobs today. So we're very much already extending our intellectual reach with our technology, which enables us to keep up with this uh, ever higher skill ladder. And we're going to literally make ourselves smarter as these machines you know, move from our pockets into our clothing, into our bodies and brains, and actually extend human intellectual reach further. We have an emailer who asked, and he asked that, I embrace the progress of technology wholeheartedly, but at some point, don't we run the risk of technology becoming too human and realizing that they are modern slaves and face a possible revolt? Well. He brings up an interesting issue uh, regarding the legal rights of machines. And uh, nobody worries that about that much today. But it's not going to be a clear distinction between uh, human and machine as we get to the 2030s and 2040s. In fact, even a biological human that was born in the, in the ordinary course uh, will have their brains enhanced with non-biological intelligence. And ultimately, that non-biological component a portion of our intelligence will be far more capable than the biological portion. And so, you know, is that a machine? Or is that a human? Or we'll have machines where there's no biological component, but they're very precise copies of, of biological people, and they're going to act in exactly the same way. It's going to be all mixed up. You're not going to be able to walk in a room and say, OK, humans on the left side of the room, machines on the right. It's, it's going to be very much an integration of, non, of biological and non-biological intelligence, just as it is today, except that the non-biological portion is going to get a lot more capable. And ultimately, they're going to press for their own legal rights. Uh, and there's already a lot of interesting discussion about that. Uh, and you know, I think that, that will happen, uh, you know, particularly when you can have an entity that's completely non-biological that's just as convincing in terms of their uh, sophistication and complexity of their emotions as humans. And emotional intelligence is not some little sideshow to our intelligence is actually the cutting edge. Because in terms of the logical, analytical things we do, machines can already do a pretty good job of that. Very few mathematicians could hold up to, let's say, Mathematica. And recently, mathematical theorems have been done as a collaboration between the human mathematician and the machine. But emotion is actually the most complicated and sophisticated thing we do. But ultimately, we will understand that as well. And these future machines will have emotional intelligence. One of the arguments or things you bring out in your books are the fact that the ability for a brain to be downloaded into a synthetic body or a version two body, as you call it. What do you mean by that? Well, as I mentioned, we're going to be merging with non-biological intelligence. We'll have nanobots go inside our bodies and brains. And uh, ultimately, we'll have billions of nanobots and other ways in which we're going to be in very direct touch with non-biological intelligence. So then my intelligence is a combination of both my biological intelligence, all the ion channels and neurotransmitters in my brain, and all of this non-biological machine intelligence. Now, the machine part of the intelligence, can clearly we can clearly download the contents of that easily. We do that all the time with our machines. Machines can share their knowledge, th their states uh, at electronic speeds, which is actually a million times faster than human brains can, can share knowledge. Uh, but ultimately, we'll be able to tap into the biological uh, patterns as well. We'll be able to have these nanobots scan the state of our ion channels, neurotransmitter concentrations, interneuronal connection patterns, 
and extract that information. Uh, but principally, I don't see that as the, the, the real quintessential scenario. I see us becoming essentially more and more non-biological. And that a non-biological intelligence can download knowledge and skills, as we saw in the matrix. We do that all the time with our, with our computers. I and mean, we spent years training one research computer to understand human speech. We trained it like a child. We patiently corrected its errors. We exposed it to thousands of hours of speech. And over years, it did a better and better job. And finally, it was commercially viable. Now, if you want your computer to understand human speech, you don't have to go through those years of training like we do have to do with every human child. You can just do load the evolved patterns of this one research computer that learned its lessons. It's called loading the software. Machines can take their learning, their skills, and share them at electronic speeds, which is a million times faster than we can share our knowledge with language. Although the fact that we can share it at all gives us uh, one up, gives us a leg up on other species. When you uh, consider the future of how man and machine will be together and, and the ethical dilemmas, where does the, hu the government come in? Because do you see more oversight for these uh, technologies as they progress? Well, it's a complex issue. Sometimes people say, well, look at the stem cell issue and there isn't the government going to stop progress in, for example, biotechnology. But we actually see that issues like that, and stem cells is a good example, are really just a stone in the river. The, the progress flows around it. And even within stem cells, there's, there's very active stem cell research. I mean, I support stem cell research. I don't think we should have restrictions on it. But even with the restrictions, uh, the real holy grail of stem cell uh, therapies, which is be able to take my own skin cells and create a, an adult, a stem cell that's pluripotent, is making substantial progress. And it's certainly not slowing down work in biotechnology. But there is actually a role for government in, in containing the dangers of these technologies, because we, we haven't really touched on that yet. But these technologies is a double-edged sword. And you don't have to look very far to see that. In the 20th century, there were 180 million people killed in wars. Uh, wars weren't necessarily created by technology, but certainly the destructive impact was exacerbated. And, and we see now we have this uh, asymmetric warfare uh, where an individual can be empowered to, to, to be destructive. And the quintessential threat we face right now is in biotechnology. Now, on, on the one hand, biotechnology is empowering us to reprogram biology to overcome disease like cancer and heart disease. And there's already in the pipeline very dramatic new tools, new drugs that really reprogram biology away from disease, you know, positive things. Uh, but it could also empower a bioterrorist to reprogram a biological virus to be more deadly or more communicable or more stealthy. And the tools to do that and the knowledge to do that is pretty widespread. And so how do we deal with that? Well, some people say, well, let's just not go down this path. It's too dangerous. Let's relinquish the whole field. That's a bad idea for three reasons. Number one, it would deprive us of these profound benefits, like overcoming suffering and eliminating disease and so on. Secondly, it would, requ would require a totalitarian government. I mean, that's, that was the, the moral and brave new world. And thirdly, it wouldn't work. It would just drive these technologies underground where they'd be less stable. And the responsible scientists who are trying to defend us from these dangers wouldn't have easy access to the tools to do that. And that's really the moral uh, or the, that, that is really the strategy that we need to follow, which is to develop uh, these defenses. And the good news is we actually have the tools and the knowledge to, to create defenses against, for example, new biological viruses. RNA interference, which I mentioned earlier, can turn genes off. Well, viruses are genes, and RNA interference can turn off viruses. And I propose, in fact, Bill Joy and I had an op-ed piece in the New York Times a while back calling for a Manhattan-style project to create a rapid response system that could, in a week, sequence a new virus. And that's accelerating. It took us five years to sequence HIV, 31 days for SARS. We can sequence a virus now in one or two days, develop an RNA I medication, and gear up manufacturing. You can do that very quickly. And that's really the strategy we need to deploy. And I'll give you an example where we've actually done that. And we have a new danger, uh, which emerged 30 years ago, the software virus. And they've actually become very sophisticated and, and actually quite dangerous because we have a lot of important systems that run on computers, like 9-11 response systems, and we fly airplanes by software. And, uh, and we've actually contained this danger quite well. Uh, if a new sulfur virus is identified, uh, it is